Welcome to you all. Welcome if you're online. Have we got anyone online? Excellent. Three. Welcome. Welcome to those of you in the building. And we particularly extend a welcome to our Indigenous brothers and sisters who might be worshipping with us this morning. And we recognise that we gather to worship on Wurundjeri land. Today, we're going to hear from one of our own, Tim and Kanini, um, missionaries in Melbourne. I don't know if that's how they describe themselves, but I think that's how I've come to think about what they do. And they'll be telling you a bit about that through the service. Let's pray. Lord, we gather in your presence. Sometimes it's hard to stop and be still before you. We just ask that you would help us do that now. Open our ears to what you would have us hear and learn this morning. Build our time of community. Help us to care for each other, to pray for each other, and to enjoy being with each other in your presence. Amen. We're going to sing, but before we do, I've got a bit of a responsive reading to invite us to think about what we're ultimately here for. So we're going to use that. I invite you to respond with the words in bold, and then we'll move straight into our singing. So just uh, excuse me for a minute. And I'm sorry, I didn't check the mics, but there we go. Our tech team have not let us down. Uh, I did have a copy of the, the reading for me to refer to. Here it is. All right, let's go. Next slide, maybe. Yeah, there we go. From different lives, we come to worship. From good weeks and bad weeks, we come to worship. Bringing great times and painful memories, we come to worship. Needing healing, needing peace, we come to worship. With hope in our hearts, we come to worship. To the Almighty God, we come to worship. To the King of Kings, we come to worship. Together, we come to worship.
come together before you to worship your name, whatever may come and whatever's been before us, we just want to gather and praise you for who you are and, and what you're doing in our lives. Amen. All right, we're not quite done. Uh, as I chose the next song, I was just thinking about, um, well, two things really. Uh, this song is called Christ Be All Around Me. And uh, I was thinking about that image of the spirit as comforter. We don't tend to use that word comforter in Australia as a doona, but this week I was looking in some beautiful homeware shops. There are some beautiful soft blankets out there and really all I wanted to do was wrap them around myself. And so when we sing about Christ be all around me, it's actually one of the images as this song brings up for me, this idea about Christ is actually in cradling us and enfolding us. Uh, but this song is a prayer um, and it talks about some aspects of God and follows them up with a request. So strength of God, lift me up. Eyes of God, be my sight. Heart of God, satisfy and sustain me. Voice of God, guide me. Hand of God, defend me. Breath of God, bring me peace. What, we want you, what I'm going to invite you to do now is to just identify within those six prayers. So what's your prayer this morning as we sing this song? Which of those prayers is particularly for you today? And I'm going to read them out again in a minute. And if you're comfortable, just put your hand up if that's going to be your prayer in particular. You can choose more than one if you need to. I will be cranky if you put your hand up six times. I am asking for a little bit of discernment as we work through this. But what's your prayer? And as we sing it, as you sing each line, recognise it as your prayer for yourself or maybe your prayer for someone else in this room this morning. Strength of God, lift me up. Have a look around if you want to see who's putting their hand up. Eyes of God, be my sight. Heart of God, satisfy and sustain. Voice of God, be my guide. Hand of God, my defence. Breath of God, bring me peace. This is our song, this is our prayer for ourselves and for each other this morning. Let's sing it in that light. <clears throat>
Amen. Let's make that our prayer for each other this week too. So, got a little, got a little bit of introductions to do this morning and I've dragged out some welcome cards because uh, we'd like to welcome a few people. We've got Amelia who's visiting us. Oh, and sorry, we've got some visitors as well from Diamond Valley. Our next visitors come a long way to be with us this morning. Well, actually, they haven't come all this way just to be with us. But Jimmy's here. Some of you met him yesterday. Jimmy's from Kabali in Uganda. And as you might know, we have some particular links to uh, Uganda through our support of Beyond Subsistence, which is an agroforestry aid group that's doing a lot of great work, particularly in Uganda. And Jimmy is the chair of the Kabali Agriculture Network. There's some photos there of him with our son Joshua in 2018 and then back again in 2022. Uh, the trees are growing. Joshua's clearly growing too. Jimmy's in Melbourne because he's also with Rotary and he's the president of his local Rotary group. Uh, and they're, I don't know if you knew, but the Rotary International Convention's in Melbourne next week. Uh, and so Rotary have sponsored him. So welcome, Jimmy, and let me give you a welcome card. Uh, and this person is not actually a welcome as such, it's someone very familiar to many of you, but there's a slight difference in something we're asking this person to do. And so we're gonna reintroduce them too. Jonathan? <laughs> Hello. I'm going to invite Faye up. Um, we're having our quarterly meeting after church today. Everyone is welcome. We're going to have some soup and bread, I believe. So that's going to be awesome. But one of the exciting things we're going to do is vote on Faye becoming a deacon. Um, Faye has accepted the nomination of, of joining deacons. So I thought I'd invite Faye up and we, some of you may not know Faye very well. So I thought I'd ask you a few questions. <laughs> Faye, how long have you been coming to West Preston? Um, 30 plus years. Um, although there was, a, there was a gap in the middle of about eight years when our children were uh, teenagers. I met my husband here, who is on sound today. <laughs> and we married here and yeah, raised our children here. Wonderful. And tell us a bit about what you do during the week. I believe you have started a new job relatively recently. Yeah, I was at a bit of a loose end um, at the beginning of the year in February um, and looking for something a bit different to do and my sister who is a uh, who was acting principal at Cairo Christian School in Druin said they were desperate for learning support uh, people in the classroom and would I consider going down there a couple of days a week and uh, working in a particularly uh, difficult year eight classroom with some boys who were reluctant learners so I'm there two days a week and I do some admin for them from home one day a week. And I stay overnight with my sister, which is an added bonus. And you have some very interesting qualifications. Can you tell me, you are the most, one of the most creative people I know. Can you tell us about your qualification that relates to that? Um, I recently completed a uh, fine art degree with honors in gold and silversmithing. So I'm a jeweler who, Wears, he's not wearing any jewellery today. So for all your custom jewellery needs, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> um, so you've been here a long time. Tell us why you've stayed for so long and what it is you really value about West Preston Baptist Church. I was thinking about this question because I was given a bit of a heads up on it. 
So I was thinking there's three things, I think, that I really value about this place. One is that um, it's a place of spiritual nourishment where I can grow um, as a child of God. Um, it's also a, a place of acceptance and care. Um, I, I love the people here and I know that I am loved. And it's also a place of service. Um, there's a place for me and for everyone to serve, whether that's in the church, whether it's in the community or, or in the wider world. So um, growth, acceptance and service. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Faye. And um, we look forward to welcoming you onto Deacons you. with your vote. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and the last introduction is actually to uh, Tim and Kanini. They're going to tell us, well, Tim's going to tell us now about uh, the work that he does a little bit, and then he'll bring us the message in a, in a bit after that. Well, thank you. <clears throat> um, it's wonderful to be able to share about this. And first of all, thank you to all of you, because a little while ago, you voted to support us financially, partner with us financially in our work, which is remarkable because I know a lot of you have no idea what we actually do. So there's a lot of trust and affirmation there. Thank you. Um, well, we're with the Navigators. The Navigators, it's not so much an organization, it's really a, a discipleship movement. And I'll share a little bit more about how they started uh, during the message. Um, but but uh, we work with international students, young professionals. We're based around Melbourne University. And uh, a lot of what I do, it's not so much the Bible study groups, although you know we, we do have a community there. It's more what happens outside of that, the one-on-one -on -one meetings to disciple people. Our ambition is to disciple people so that they will in turn disciple others in their natural network. Um, so I've been in this work for nearly 14 years now, about half of that was part-time, and then more recently going into full-time. Kanini was heavily involved, as were the children when they were younger, but now it's a bit more difficult, also because we've moved further away from uni. Food is a very big part of it. We get together every Thursday night, we have dinner, we'll have some games, and then we'll have some kind of Bible study or workshop that's designed to be a safe place for people to bring their non-believers just to get exposed to other believers and get exposed to Jesus. Um, it's also t at those, those community gatherings, it's also a time when the believers can learn to stretch their legs a bit, have a go at teaching or leading a Bible study and things like that. But as I mentioned, the main thing that we do and uh, the, the main place where the fruit comes from really is in those, those more personal private meetings outside of the community gathering. And uh, so I'll share a bit more about that later. Let's see if I've missed anything. Discipling people through the stages of life. Unfortunately, a lot of university ministries, they'll, they'll welcome the students and <clears throat> they'll, they'll journey with the students, but when the students leave, it's, it's adios, goodbye, and there's no further contact. Um, we, we believe discipleship needs to go on further than that. And so there, there's actually um, <clears throat> a, a parents group that we're starting to form from alumni who have graduated, they got married, they've had kids, and so just helping them to navigate that new phase of life um, with Christ at the centre. Yeah, I think that'll do for now. Thank you. Okay, the first one is from um, Mark chapter 1, 14 to 20. Later on, after Jesus' time in the desert, after Jesus, John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. One day... As Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. 
and they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. So this is a reading from Mark 2, 13 to 17. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other dis, 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 sorry, disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And the last one is from Mark again, chapter 3, 13 to 17. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him and they came to him. Then he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles. They were to accompany him and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. These were the 12 he chose. Simon, who he named Peter, James and John, the, son, the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Jesus, uh, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. We come to our time of prayer now, and I'm interested to know what you think we should be praying for this morning. Are there situations in our community, in our country, in our world that you'd like us to pray for this morning. Kids, you're very welcome to call out some thoughts too about things we could be praying for. But I'm inviting you to shape our prayers this morning. Hit me. Our country. The children who are... Yes, the, the um, Exford Primary School children who were hurt in the bus crash. Am I going to show my ignorance if I say I don't know who Tim Keller is? Yep, thank you. Yep. Floods and heat waves, isn't it? Yep, terrible. Refugees in Bangladesh who've been faced with a um, cyclone or tornado, uh, typhoon, I think. Yes, Cliff? Yep. yep, and there's lots of places of war at the moment. Obviously, the war in Ukraine continues. Yes. Um, Eliza was a, is a high school student who was crossing the road um, and got hit by a car and had really quite catastrophic injuries, um, um, brain injuries, and, and she, she's in 
from Diamond Valley, Oops. and the community I know is really trying to support her and her whole family. Isn't it, isn't it great, you know, that, that God can, cares about Eliza and the use of artificial intelligence and everything in between? Like, I just find that quite amazing. So um, for those online who might have missed some of the things people have called out, we've, we've, um, we've mentioned our, our country and our world. We've um, the children injured in the um, bus crash this week in, in, um, in Melbourne, the, the voice referendum, Tim Keller, uh, a, a US um, preacher and teacher has, has died. Europe floods, heat waves, refugees in Bangladesh have been hit by a typhoon. We're praying that the world is free of war. Think about Ukraine. Um, and you know that, that, that these new technology of all sorts is actually harnessed for good things and not, not, for, not for harm. Yep. Yeah, we can thank God for law and order and the, the good systems that we have in it to keep us safe. All right, so I'm going to pray. I'm not going to. I'm going to, <laughs> going to pray for that. Um, I'll, I'll allow some silence for you to add your own prayers. I'm sure there's other things that you haven't called out. Um, but let, let's let's turn to God in prayer now. Lord God, we've sung how great you are and how we just want to praise you and we've got 10,000 reasons why we can and should praise and worship and bless who you are. And one of the things we're so grateful for is that you are a God that is intimately concerned about us uh, and our lives and you know what's going on for us and you know the things that are on our minds. And so we lift before you right now the people in our own situation, in our own communities, in our own um, uh, concerns that we just want to pray for now. We just name them silently before you. Lord, people in our, in our local community are hurting and we've, we've heard some of that makes the news and some of it doesn't ever ever hit a headline but we lift before you the kids and their families have been injured in the bus crash and some of them have had their lives changed you know irreparably and we just pray that you would be a support for them we pray for our country and we thank you that we have good systems of governance and law and order that help keep us safe and we particularly pray now for this um, referendum that's coming up that, that to seek a seek a, uh, you know, a respectful uh, dialogue around um, the voice referendum, um, but also perhaps to right some historic wrongs. And just pray that you would guide us as we, we engage with that process too. When we turn our eyes to our wider world, it's, it's hard not to feel quite um, despairing at, at some of the the things that are going on, some of them are, you know, consequences of, of the changing climate and our and our lack of care for our world. But we remember the floods and the heat waves and the typhoons and all the catastrophic consequences that come from that. We remember too the places around the world where wars are happening. And we just pray that you would be the God of peace in those situations. And Lord, as we've heard in our readings, you've called people from many works of walks of life to follow you and to, pres to prize people as precious ones to seek, find and restore. Lord, we want to be your disciple. We want to be your agents of peace and care in this world. And we want to fish with you. We ask for your spirit's help in all our prayers this morning. Amen. Okay, we're going to be sending the kids out this morning and um, as always, we have someone who's thought about what's going to happen out there. We'll call them the leader. Um, but they need a helper. That person needs, has no special qualifications. They just need to put on the helper's hat. So 
And while they do that, Tim's going to make his way up here. Well, you, you all should have got a sheet with the wheel on it. You got one? Excellent. Jadari and Nova did a good job handing those out. Now, don't get too excited because you don't actually need that till right at the end of the message. But just, just keep it there and uh, I'll prompt you or you'll, you'll know when it's time. Well, 1933, nearly 100 years ago, a man named Dawson Trotman met with a young sailor in the US Navy named Les Spencer. Les had heard Dawson, that, that Dawson can help him grow to become a soul winner, someone who brings people to Jesus. But being in the Navy, Les was often away for long periods of time. But during his leave, he would have six weeks of uninterrupted time on shore. Now Dawson, well, he was a petrol station attendant in California. It was a stable job and it gave him an apartment out the back of the petrol station. So for Les's six weeks of leave, he would stay with Dawson in his apartment and Dawson would train him in things like how to memorize and quote scripture, how to do the work of apologetics and evangelism, how to lead Bible study and things like that. Les's ambition was to become a soul winner and Dawson Trotman, this petrol station attendant, helped to train him for that task. When Les would go back on the ship, he would practice the things that he learned from Dawson and Les led a number of his fellow sailors to Christ. And one of them had known Les for quite some time, and he noticed the change in Les's life. And he asked Les, what's the secret to this change? So to answer the question, Les brought this man to Dawson Trotman and said, Dawes, teach him what you taught me. And Dawson simply replied, no, you teach him. You teach him. And thus was reborn or rediscovered the vision of discipleship. Discipleship, of course, it's not new. It's one life building into another person's life. We read of it in scripture, shaping someone, molding them. It can be a bit like what a parent aims to do with their child. Sometimes it's helpful to say what discipleship is not. It's not a program. It's not a curriculum. It's not about growing in Bible knowledge or being able to answer lots of questions. It's relational. It's done in relationship. And because of this, it's not something that you can do well with a crowd or a group of people. It's personal. It's one person's life building into another person's life. We read of it in ancient times, the days of the early rabbis and other ancient cultures had their own discipleship practices as well. But for much of Christian history after Jesus, discipleship was more or less lost buried in the growing dominance of tradition and hierarchy from the institutional church in the Middle Ages. But today, many churches speak of the need for discipleship, but that was not the case a hundred years ago in the days of Dawson and Les. In those days, the, the big message was, get the gospel to the masses, gospel crusades, gospel rallies. And it's in that era that the Billy Graham crusades flourished. And there may be some here who came to Christ through the Billy Graham Crusades. But no one was talking about discipleship or following up believers. They hadn't been for centuries. It happened here and there as someone took someone else under their wing, but it wasn't a well-considered part of the equation, so to speak. That is not until this young man, Dawson Trotman, discipled Les Spencer and taught him how to disciple others. Within the next months, Led had won a dozen of his fellow sailors to Christ, and each one was discipled and taught how to disciple the next. The ship they were on was the USS West Virginia. 
Before long, 125 sailors on that ship were being discipled and discipling others. Within several years, there was a discipleship movement on 50 ships of the US Navy. And by the end of World War II, over 8,000 people across various ships and bases were experiencing the personal reality of life on life discipleship and learning to do the same. The Navigators is a discipleship ministry, a discipleship movement. Today it's in over 100 countries, but it's those ships of the US Navy where the Navigators were born. And Dawson Trotman is the founder nearly 100 years ago. While this discipleship movement grew, Billy Graham in his Gospel Crusades was winning tens of thousands of people to Christ every year. But Billy Graham was unable to sleep at nights. He spoke of the burden that weighed on him. This burden being the thousands of people whom he was bringing into the kingdom through his crusades, but who he said were left as spiritual babies. No one to, to be their spiritual parent, as it were, to nurture them and care for them. No one to help them be grounded in the faith. No one to equip them to, to, to grow themselves in the faith. No one to equip them to help others grow. Billy Graham knew Dawson well, and he knew of the great discipleship movement that was being birthed there. So Billy went to Dawson and said, Dawes, you have to help us with our follow-up. And Billy continued, you see, Dawes, I've been studying the great evangelists and the great revivals, and I failed to see that there was ever much of a follow-up program, but we need it. We need it. We're having an average of 6,000 people say yes to Christ every month. We need your help, Dawes. And Dawson replied, Billy, I can't follow up 6,000 people. My work is always with individuals and small groups. I just don't have the time. You're going to have to ask someone else. Billy and Dawson went back and forth like this on a number of occasions until one time Billy grabbed Dawson by the shoulders and says, who else will I ask? Who is majoring in this? And Dawson knew he had been majoring in it at a time when no one else was. So Dawson and his team put together a small follow-up pack, verses to memorize and instructions on how to memorize scripture, some simple Bible studies on key promises from God and the like. It wasn't full discipleship, it was more like throwing a survival kit to someone. But for these thousands and thousands of spiritual babies coming from Billy's crusades, it was a great step in the right direction. And before long, other Christian groups began to see the need and the impact of discipleship, ordinary discipleship in the, in the normal walks of life. And so other disciple-making movements began to flourish. Movements like Campus Crusade for Christ, now called Power to Change. But discipleship itself, it's not new. As I said, it goes back to ancient times. All the rabbis did it. In fact, part of the expectation of being a rabbi is that you would have your own disciples your own following of people who wanted to learn from your life in particular. The idea of being someone's disciple was that you were there to receive whatever their life could pass on to you, whether it's wisdom or insight, methods, techniques. There was a blessing in ancient Israel. I'm going to bless you all now. May you be clothed in the dust of your rabbi. May you be clothed in the dust of your rabbi. The, the idea behind this blessing was that it was a privilege to be discipled by a rabbi. And may you be so invited, so welcomed by your rabbi that you're, you're, you're staying that close that the dust of his feet clothes you. That was the blessing. And so it's no surprise that Jesus, the great rabbi, had his own disciples as well. It's interesting when you look at the life of Jesus, his mission and his strategy. Have you ever thought about that? The mission of Jesus and the strategy of Jesus. We know he came to do a job. He came to live, to die, and to rise again. The gospel's built on those pillars, but that was more like a job he had to do, not so much his mission. There's different ways of looking at it, but let's look at it this way. His mission was to start a movement, a movement of the kingdom of God on the earth. Now, there are movements all the time. They come and they go. History is full of them. They're, they're on the pages of our books. But this movement needed to be different. This one was not to be a movement that would dissipate 
after he leaves. Not even one that would last a very long time. This movement had to be one that would never die. One that would go on for the rest of history. This was to be a movement that wouldn't vanish with the changing culture, it wouldn't dissipate with the passing of time, but a movement that would cross every cultural barrier, cross every political divide, every social divide, every economic barrier. It would reach young and old, children and leaders, families and militaries, rich and poor, slave and free. It had to be a movement that could withstand the deepest persecution and at the same time touch everyone. This is the movement that Jesus was required to start. A movement like nothing else the world has ever seen. He didn't come to fulfill this movement, but to kickstart it. A movement of the kingdom of God on earth that would continue until heaven and earth are one. That was his mission. And he had three and a half years to do it. And you thought your job description was a tough one. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? Look past for a moment, look past the fact that we're living in this movement today. If someone handed you that job description, you'd say it's impossible, can't be done. Nice idea, mate, but it can't be done. But that was not an option for Jesus. He knew the gravity of his mission, and so we can be confident that he calculated his strategy carefully, and he calculated to win. But let's say we were in his shoes, just for a moment. If we had to start that movement, how might we do it? In, in our world today, we'd probably launch Facebook and Instagram pages, build a website, create this online presence, try and tap into some great personalities in the political world, the business world, entertainment world, raise lots of money. The movement has to be funded somehow. There'd be lots of meetings, lots of trips, a busy schedule. If we could get some position of national leadership or international recognition, that would be wonderful. You see, we can't just say, oh, the Holy Spirit's going to do it. We'll just leave it to the Holy Spirit. He's not a dictator. He doesn't run the show in that way. He's a partner. The Holy Spirit is always looking for someone or something to partner with. Jesus had to get this movement off the ground before the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. He had three and a half years to do it. For Jesus, none of the things that I mentioned before were his strategy. You know, at one point, the Jews tried to make him king. Jesus refused. He didn't explain why they wouldn't understand. But becoming a political king would have damaged his strategy, not helped it. But think for a moment about another option that Jesus had, which doesn't really apply to you and I. If anyone could draw a crowd, it was him. He could feed people out of thin air. He could turn water into alcohol. Yes, anyone? He could heal every sickness, raise every dead person. If there were, ever was a winning combination, that was it. He had it. He had it. But even that wasn't his strategy. There were no barriers to, be, to him becoming as insanely popular as he wanted. But that is not what he wanted. His strategy was to choose 12 men. 12 ordinary men, not all well-educated. A lot of them were fishermen, not well-educated at all. One was a tax collector who was well educated, but he was despised by everyone else. Another was a zealot, a, a religious fanatic who just didn't fit in with anyone. It was a really mixed bag. And for three years, he discipled this group. And out of them, he chose three in particular, Peter, James and John, those sons of thunder. I, I wish I knew what they did to get that name. And these three he discipled more intently. A lot of what we remember from Jesus, his, his stories, his parables, his miracles, it was done with the crowds. To be sure, Jesus wanted to reach the crowds. He didn't let his discipleship dismiss his ministry to the masses. He taught the crowds, he fed them, he healed them, he loved them. But his mission was not going to succeed, ultimately, by ministering to the masses. His winning strategy had to be deeply personal. He wasn't calling people to an ideology or a theology or a doctrine. He was calling people to someone, to Father God. His strategy had to be deeply personal. His mission was ultimately to win the world, but what this looked like on the ground day to day 
was to train 12 men and three in particular. And it was through them and their work with others that the masses would finally be reached. The 12 went with him everywhere. He spent far more time alone with them than he did with all of the crowds in all of his travels. He was discipling them and he was training them to disciple others. Do you see his strategy? His strategy was people, ordinary people in whatever walk of life they were in. People who would follow the master and therefore people whom others would follow. The success or failure of Jesus's mission overall, it hinged not on his work with the crowds, it hinged on the success of his discipleship of those 12. He put all of his eggs in one basket, so to speak. I hope we get that he invested deeply in a few in order to reach the many. That's the principle. He invested deeply in a few in order to reach the many. This mindset of discipleship, it permeates the New Testament. It's like what Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 9, whatever you have heard from me or whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And again, in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow my example, says Paul, as I follow the example of Christ. There are many examples in the New Testament of this life on life, one life shaping other lives. But a classic verse that really captures this sense of discipleship in the New Testament churches, it's 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul here expresses four generations of disciple making. The things you've, you've heard from me, that's generation one, have been passed on to you, that's generation two. You should pass them on to reliable people, generation three, who will also be qualified to pass them on to others. Spiritual generations. This is how the early church thought. This is how they worked. One person passing to the next. Paul uses this word entrust. Entrust these things to faithful people as if you're passing on something of value. And when you entrust something to someone, there's responsibility attached to it. You've entrusted them with something and they have the responsibility to do with it whatever they're supposed to do. Do you and I look at the growth that we have received and see it as something of value and something that has been entrusted to us with the expectation being like what Paul says, that we will pass it on to others. You and I have been entrusted with the spiritual growth we've received. In Matthew 4.19, Jesus called his first disciples and he, he laid out his personal goal for them. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. He's inviting them into a discipleship relationship where he can shape them, mold them, train them so they can reach others. That was the start of his ministry. And then at the end, just before he ascends to heaven, he brings a sharp focus back to his strategy. And he brings together all he's been training in them and teaching them for three years. Matthew 28, 19, he says, Now as you go, make disciples of all nations, make disciples to the ends of the earth. Jesus had his sights set on winning the world and his method was people. Can you imagine that? Such a, a high and lofty goal, unite heaven and earth in one, and his method was people. Ordinary people in ordinary walks of life, just like you and I. I'm not a pastor. I've never been to Bible college. Ordinary people discipling others in partnership with God, within the context of everyday life. In Jesus' closing remarks, he instructed his disciples to teach others everything he's taught them. That includes the command to go and make disciples. Wrapped up in all this is the, the idea that in Jesus' mind that his disciples will be reproducers for Christ. That's, that's his strategy. We can start with non-believers. We can start with believers. It really doesn't matter who. The goal is to be bringing people closer to Christ because that's what's on his heart. I love it that Jesus didn't write a book. He didn't set up a new Bible study course. He didn't start a church. He didn't build a Bible college or lay out a curriculum. His winning strategy was not the latest ministry method, nor college degrees. These things are all helpful. 
but they weren't center stage. There were no qualifications that he required, except for two, that we be ordinary people who follow the master and that we be ready and sensitive to help someone else do the same. In the navigators, when we disciple someone, it's not so that they can come on, on board as a staff with the navigators. It's not trying to build up an organization. We disciple them so they can disciple others in their natural networks. And uh, of course, I have to practice that as well. Outside of my job with the navigators, I have to be discipling people if I'm going to, to live what I preach. And so there's a number of other Aussies that, that I disciple. But to finish off, there's a model that we use, and you can pull out your papers now. And if you don't have a writing implement, now's a good time to get one. There's some, some blanks that uh, I'll help you to fill in. This is a model that we use just to help us remember what to give attention to in discipling someone. It's a model of a wheel with Christ at the center. The rim of the wheel represents the faithful Christian in action. The rim, that's where all the action is. That's where the rubber hits the road. But where the wheel gets its power from is the hub, the center part. And what connects the hub to the rim are the spokes, part in the engineering lesson. So in the center there, you can write Christ the center. He is the hub. He is where the power comes from. He is where the vision comes from. It's his model, his example that we follow. Now this wheel has four spokes connecting the power source there to the rim. The two vertical spokes, they're about our relationship with the Father. Think of it as an up-down, up-down. So in discipleship, it's good to help someone grow to use Scripture effectively in their personal life and with others. Scripture is so often the tool of choice for the Holy Spirit. So in that top spoke, you can write the Word or Scripture or something to that effect. And then the other vertical spoke we have there, you can write prayer to encourage and build our prayer life, taking it more from an activity to more of a lifestyle of a heart. So they're the vertical spokes, our relationship with God. Then the two horizontal spokes, they're reaching out. So think of that in terms of our relationship with people. So the one on the right, you can write fellowship. Fellowship. Two or more fellows in one ship. That's how I think about it. Fellowship, it's not about friendship per se. It's more about people joining together to do something because of a common goal. Like, like people on a ship. They're working the ship, they're working it to get the ship going in a certain direction. Propelling each other towards the same goal. So that's fellowship. And then the other horizontal spoke, the one on the left, is witnessing. Practicing telling God's story. Practicing telling my own faith stories. Helping our spiritual life become natural not compartmentalized. So that's the wheel. And, and when a wheel kicks into action, the spokes all get blurred up. You don't really distinguish them so much, but you do see the hub and you do see the rim. You do see Christ in the center. Now, as neat as that diagram is, Dawson Trotman came up with that actually, and it's, it works. So that's why it's still around. As neat as that is, there's still one key ingredient that's missing. And that is the vision of spiritual generations. That discipleship is not about spiritually babysitting someone, but it's about helping them learn to grow in their own life and learning how to pass it on. So when I first start meeting with someone, they often think they're there for me to just help them grow in whatever sense they have in mind, but I'll drop a seed of, of spiritual generations to vision and I'll tell them, look, I'm meeting with you and I'm really grateful. I love this, but I'm hoping that you'll do this with someone else one day because you can and because the Lord wants it. So the vision of spiritual generations. To bring all of this together, in the NAVs, we like to use these three taglines. Ordinary people, transforming lives, spiritual generations. And in my mind, that really sums up what our ministry is about and what we, what we want to encourage every believer to do in one capacity or another. Ordinary people, transforming lives, spiritual generations. So I thank you and Kanini thanks you for partnering with us financially in this work. 
And I hope that this message has opened your eyes um, a little bit more to Jesus' strategy. I find there's so much in his strategy that even I don't grasp. And uh, I hope that this has inspired you as well to think about the growth that you've received and see it as something of value that has been entrusted to you that you can pass on to others in some way. Thanks, Cliff. All right, let's pray, shall we? Father, we bless you that your vision for us is so much bigger than our vision for ourselves. When you thought of transforming the world, your chosen strategy was people. Though we feel small, we feel like we often don't have anything to give or um, the opportunities in front of us, uh, they can be daunting, we can be afraid of them. But I thank you that your passion and your, your vision for us is so much greater than that. And I ask that each one of us would seize the opportunities that we have to bless and encourage believers around us, to urge them and challenge them, and where the relationship allows it to hold each other accountable. And that you would help us to, uh, to, to be excited at the opportunity that you give us for our life to, in a sense, be passed on in some way to those around us, whether they're believers or non-believers, that we would have in our sights the ambition that whoever we're around, that our goal is to simply lead them closer and closer to you. Thank you. Amen. Tim was wrapping up, I was thinking, we, we need to pray for Tim. And, uh, and Paul reigns over and he says, we need to pray for Tim. So clearly the Spirit is prompting us. That's not an uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. So would, it, would you like to stand there and a few people might like to come and gather around and pop your hands on Tim. And is there someone who'd like to pray for Tim and for Kadini and the ministry that they do? Someone who'd like to come and do that? Thanks, Tony. We can't have the whole church. Some people. Let's pray. Lord, what a privilege it is to be part of this church, to be able to hear stories of the lives of people who sit here each week. Lord, we thank you that Tim and Kanini have found their way to be part of our community. We pray that the spirit that's within both of them, that clearly is striving to make disciples of others, may flourish. Lord, we pray for them in their everyday life, for the sustaining of a family of five. May you be with them all as they journey through school with their children. Lord, for the vision that uh, Kanini has brought to us to be supporting schools in Kenya. It's a mosaic. And as they go this, this morning, may you walk in front of them, be behind them, be above them, be below them. Christ, be all around them. Amen. And now we come to time for communion. The week 
extend an invitation to all those whom the Lord loves to participate in this communion feast. And please remember the Lord loves us all. And Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. And today, just as Jesus called Simon and Andrew, James, John, and then Levi, and eventually the 12, to follow him, Jesus still calls us to follow him. And as his disciples, we become the hands and feet of Jesus. And in so doing, we maintain the presence of Jesus in the world. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread after he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us give thanks. God of all creation, we thank and praise you for the love and compassion you abundantly share with us. And as we take this bread and drink the cup, which passes from hand to hand, may we remember what we are doing. As we remember, may we feel the presence of your son, Jesus, and in the act of sharing, may the spirit of our living Lord pass from heart to heart. Amen. Can we please have um, some service for the communion? Thank you. Would you please hold the cup so that we can all drink together? covenant in my blood. This do for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
I thought we'd sing a song that is a discipleship prayer as we finish up. Um, it's called Build Your Kingdom Here. Help us to be your disciples. Help us to go and tell of your greatness in our own lives and to encourage others to, to meet you and learn from you too. Amen.